Good morning. Where's my, there's my agenda. Yeah. Okay, the State Government, Tribal Affairs, and Tribal Relations and Elections Committee will come to order on Friday, January 26th. We have this hearing and two more before the cutoff, and uh, I'd like to welcome you all. Little, little business here. What we're going to do is we're going to hear several of the bills, and then we will break for executive action. And then probably the last thing on the agenda, just so you know, will be 6406, because I want to get the other stuff done and then have make sure we have enough time to, uh, to get to that bill, since... Uh, Virtually everybody in the room has signed up to testify on that one. This should, the rest of it, famous last word, should go pretty quickly. So we're going to start off with... Uh, real quick. We're going to start off with Senator Taco today. <laughs> uh, six bill, Senate Bill 6283, repealing expiration date that affects fire service mobilization. And that would be Melissa, right? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Before you is Senate Bill 6283, which concerns technical changes by the Department of Enterprise Services and as at the request of the Department of Enterprise Services. By way of background, uh, hang on. Wrong bill, right? <laughs> Repealing the expiration date on fire service. You're right. I, I apologize. If DES wants to request that, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you are correct. It concerns fire mobilizations. By way of background, a mobilization is used when a resource beyond those available through existing agreements will be requested and when available sent in response to an emergency or disaster situation that has exceeded the capabilities of available local resources. The Chief of the Washington State Patrol has authority to mobilize jurisdictions under the Washington State Fire Service Mobilization Plan. And once a state mobilization is declared, all state and local agencies that participate in the mobilization are generally reimbursed through the state's disaster response account. In 2015, the legislature authorized an expansion of the term mobilization to authorize all risk resources rather than firefighting resources and prohibit fire resources from being mobilized to assist with police activities during civil protests or demonstration. All risk resources include those resources regularly provided by fire authorities in response to natural and man-made incidents. This includes but is not limited to resources provided for wild land fires, landslides, earthquakes, floods, or contagious diseases. The WSP is required to report annually on the, the costs of non-fire suppression emergencies in disasters. The, and the expanded scope of the state fire service mobilization was set to expire on July 1, 2019. Under this bill, the expiration date of July 1, 2019 is removed and changes to the fire service mobilization um, expand, expanded definition, which includes all risk resources and protect and prohibition against mobilization of fire resources to assist during police activities become permanent. The WSP must continue to report annually on the costs of non-fire suppression during an emergency or disaster. A fiscal note is available and shows an indeterminate impact greater than $50,000 to the disaster response account. There is a House companion which was heard by the House Public Safety Committee on the 23rd and is scheduled for exact next week. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions? All right, Senator Taco. What kind of tie are we wearing today? <coughs> oh, fairly conservative. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Committee, good morning. For the record, Dean Taco, State Senator, 19th Legislative District. A number of years ago, the legislature did something that seems to be working. Unfortunately, there or Maybe it was a wise thing to do. We put a uh, expiration date on it, and this is a mobilization other than for fires. Um, there was con concern and originally that it might be overused for things outside of fires, uh, but the statistics of 224 mobilizations, and out of those, only two were non-fire, I think pretty well shows that this is not overused and is working if efficiently, effectively, and we ought to take the sunset date off and let this thing continue to be a good bill and a good law. Any questions? 
Take change, pretty simple. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Ryan, yo, oh, excuse me. We have two people who want to testify on a date change. It shouldn't take more than 30 seconds, I would think. Ryan Spiller and Warren Peterson and Mr. Chair, no other witnesses have signed up not wishing to testify. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Ryan Spiller with the Washington Fire Commissioners. I can do less than 30 seconds. Ms. Van Gorkum and Senator Taco did a great job. Um, the fire defense, uh, committee does a great job with these state mobilizations for fire and it's good that we can do an all, on all of them and they certainly aren't abused. We're only using them on the most horrendous, biggest um, emergencies we have. So I appreciate you hearing this bill. Hopefully we can pass it out and get this done. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for the ability, the uh, opportunity to address you this morning. Just real quickly, just to echo the same um, same comments. Uh, this is a introduce yourself for the. Oh, I'm sorry, Warren Peterson, uh, fire chief for from East Olympia Fire District Six here in Thurston County, uh, speaking on behalf of the Washington State Fire Chiefs. Uh, the bill is a. Uh, um, almost a no-brainer. Basically, it keeps the tool in the toolbox that the fire service needs to use. It allows us to respond with mobilization to all the type of incidents that we normally respond to, not limiting it to just fire. Uh, since the bill's passage in the fiscal year 2015, there were 30 mobilizations in 2016-17, in 2017-21 mobilizations, all of which were for fire-related incidents. So uh, has not been used for uh, all risk, but we certainly want to make sure we keep the tool in the toolbox to allow districts like ours to participate in uh, a major incident and make sure that our costs are covered and allow us to fiscally participate in that regard. That's all I have unless you have any questions. Thank you. Questions? It's hard to ask a question about a date change. <laughs> okay, that will conclude the hearing on Senate Bill 6283 and we will go back up to number one on the uh, agenda, Senate Bill 6064 concerning efficiency updates for the capital budget appropriations allocated for public art. Melissa again. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Again, for the record, Melissa Van Gorkum, staff to the committee. Would you like me to speak to the proposed sub, Mr. Chair? Before you is a proposed substitute for Senate Bill 6064 on pink color paper, S4205.1. By way of background, artwork acquisition is funded through the capital budget using a formula of one half of 1% of the state's portion of construction for new buildings. This includes art allocations for construction of K-12 public schools, higher education institutes, and state agencies. The capital budget includes specific provisions for art allocations. The last two capital budgets specified that at least 85% of the funds expended by the commission must be directed towards acquisition of works of art. The commission was authorized to use up to uh, $150,000 in the amount appropriated in the most recent capital budget to conserve or maintain existing pieces of state art. Art allocations that are not expended within the ensuing two biennia are to lapse. Additionally, higher education institutes were authorized to work with the commission to expend up to 10% of the projected art allocation for a project during the design phase with one half of 1% adjusted downward by the amount expended during the design phase. Under proposed substitute Senate Bill 6064, the previously mentioned portions of the capital budget are removed and replaced with permanent statutory language that provides allocations for artwork with two adjustments. First, the commission is permitted to use up to $200,000 of the amount expended to conserve and maintain existing pieces of the state art collection. Funds lapse if not expended within the two biennia after the funds are allocated. And second, any state agency not just higher education institutes are authorized to expend up to 10% of the projected art allocation for the project during the design phase. A fiscal note was requested but has not yet re been received. There is a House version of this bill, House Bill 2809, which was heard by the House Capital Budget Committee on the 23rd and it's scheduled for exec on the 2nd. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions? You said the companion was heard in the House. That is correct. Thank you. Madam Vice Chair. No, sir. Senator Wellman. Sorry. Well, I was going to let you call Senator Wellman, but all right. <laughs> Senator Wellman, come on up. Thank you. He's ready to go.
Thank you, Mr. Chair and um, committee and members. I, for the record, Lisa Wellman, representing the 41st Legislative District from the east side of Washington, east to the foothills of the Cascades. Um, thank you so much for just l allowing me to come up here because this is really a very small technical fix, a fix but um, and it allows us to work with projects on a much more integrated scale, but um, I don't think people know about the Arts Commission and I was appointed to it and I am a huge champion um, and I want to report to you because I think it's important that first of all, this is one of the best run organizations, commissions that I've ever been appointed to. Um, I've really been incredibly impressed with our executive director, Karen Hannon, who is here, and also with the work that the commission does. Um, it really works to preserve and, and um, d develop and uh, distribute those amazing art projects that you see in your public schools, in your major buildings, in our communities around the state. It's an amazing uh, program and uh, I'm really delighted to be part of it. So um, if there are any questions, but this is, this is simply a technical fix that just works for the better and puts it in statute. Chair Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Wellman, I am just delighted um, that you are involved in this. I, I know personally from owning original Lisa Wellmans that you are very artistic <laughs> yourself. So uh, thank you for this and, and uh, I look forward to getting it out of committee soon. It is, is my pleasure and since we have been talking about art districts, creative districts around our state as a, a an economic development agent for tourism, it's especially a good connection of, for both my passions, both art and economic development. So thank you very much for hearing this. How come we don't have any Wellman art in our caucus? I'm ready, All right. just ask. All right. All right. <laughs> All right, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, Karen Hannon and Doug Levy and Mr. Chair, no other witnesses have signed in to testify or not wishing to testify. Good morning, Mr. Chair, committee members. I'm Doug Levy. I'm privileged to be before you for the Western States Arts Federation and Humanities Washington. I'm reminded of what the Seahawks defense usually says to the offense after they intercept a pass. We just did something for you. Don't screw it up. So staff has given you a great overview of this bill. Really what we're doing is taking something that um, you as a legislature have been integrating into the capital budget and giving it permanent statutory presence. So um, the, the two main changes as staff ably described, um, the, the notion of moving the 10% of the art and public places money up to the design stage to get a better project and a more integrated project made permanent and something that all the state agencies could use. And then a little bit of a bump for um, the work that the Arts Commission does in conserving a really far-flung statewide arts collection. And and we really commend the bill to you. We think it's good efficiency, makes a lot of sense, takes a year-to-year -year piece of work and makes it permanent. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, good morning, Chair Hunt and members of the committee. My name is Karen Hannon and I'm the director of the State Arts Commission. So just to add a few pieces to that, um, the State Art Collection is now um, about 42 years old. So it's one of the oldest, in fact, it's the, it's the second oldest in the country, second only to Hawaii, and they just got in a few moments before us. Um, but arguably one of the best collections in the country. We have now 4,500 pieces and they're located in 1,200 locations around the state and everything from tiny school districts to Seattle to really anywhere you can think of, there will be a presence of public art. So um, as Doug and Senator Wellman said, this really makes our work easier and it makes the whole process more efficient and effective in allowing an artist to work with the local committees during a, a design phase. I mean, if you think about um, the, what typically happens now is often a building is shovel ready um, or sometimes, you know, way into its construction before we get in there. So then we find that the the artists will come in and because so many of our projects these days are large sort of engineered built in place beautiful sculptures and so on um, which require fittings and attachments and things like that which are no big deal if you do them at the beginning of a building but when you start to come in at the end maybe the building's finished and we have to come in and add in lighting fixtures or take up a floor to have some sort of attachment it becomes way more expensive and just a whole a whole level of complexity 
um, that doesn't really make any sense. So this is really a sensible bill, and um, I commend uh, the, you know, the bill really as written, and I hope that you will support it, because I think it'll save the state money, it will shorten the artwork project timeline, and it'll just result in a better overall project and product. So thank you. Okay, thank you. And on some of these bills where there's a house companion, the you know, we'll get together with the House and decide which bill is going to move so that we don't clog too many bills into rules. So Thank you. Senator Wellman, you can have an arm wrestling match with <laughs> Representative Theringer and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. That will conclude the hearing on Senate Bill 6064. We will go to 6194 concerning Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, Melissa. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Again, for the record, Melissa Van Gorkum, staff to the committee. Before you is Senate Bill 6194, which is at the request of the Department of Veterans Affairs. By way of background, the Washington Department of Veterans Affairs provides many services, benefit, and benefits to veterans and their families. The director also holds the power to appoint and employ personnel for the department, including assistants and executive staff, and is required to designate a deputy from the executive staff to supervise in his or her absence. The director and all appointed assistants and executive staffs mu must be veterans. The Department of Veteran Affairs also operates four state veteran homes for veterans with honorable discharge who reside in the state of Washington and their spouses or domestic partners. The director must appoint a superintendent licensed by the Department of Health as a nursing home administrator to manage each state veteran home. Under Senate Bill 6194, the director will appoint a deputy director and assistant directors rather than assistants and executive staff to administer the Department of Veterans Affairs. And the title of the individual appointed to manage the state veterans' homes is changed to administrator rather than superintendent. In addition, the bill requires honorably discharged veterans be given a preference when hiring an administrator for state veterans' homes. If fiscal note is available and shows no fiscal impact, there is a House Companion, House Bill 25. 582 by Representative Reeves, which is currently in rules on second reading. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions? Do you have? Okay. Madam Vice Chair. Jerry Fugich and Heidi Audette. And Mr. Chair, that is the uh, extent of the witnesses who've signed in wishing to testify, and no one else has signed in wishing not to testify. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Heidi Audette. I'm with the Washington State Department of Veterans Affairs, and we thank you very much for... Oh, absolutely. We thank you very much for being willing to hear this bill this morning. Uh, the bill, uh, as staff mentioned, will make several important changes to our agency. It'll clarify uh, who we may serve in our PTSD counseling program uh, and allow us to serve a broader category of veterans, even if their trauma did not occur in a combat zone. It also changes the title of the leader of our state veterans' homes from a very archaic superintendent to what they're actually licensed as, which is an administrator of a nursing home. And it will give us much greater flexibility in who we can hire into those positions. Uh, given some of the challenges that we have had in hiring administrators for our veterans' homes, this will be a very positive thing for care that we provide to veterans, spouses, and widows of veterans in our homes. Thank you very much, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, I am Jerry Fugic, members of the member of the Veterans Legislative Coalition, and the VLC most strongly supports and endorses this bill, House or Senate Bill 6194. Do you have any questions? for the day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that concludes the hearing on uh, Senate Bill 6194. We will go to Senate Bill 6228, Technical Changes to Department of In-Price Services. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, again, Melissa Van Gorkum, staff to the committee. Before you is Senate Bill 6228, and this bill is at the request of the Department of Enterprise Services. By way of background, Department of Enterprise Services, or DES, provides pr products and services to support state agencies, other governmental entities, and nonprofits, and, and these services include contracting support, fleet services, and small agency human resource and fiscal services, among other things. Under the statute, an agency that uses alternative contracting methods for public works projects that exceed $25,000 must publish notice of the work in a legal newspaper at least 15 days before beginning work. In addition, bid specifications for public works above a certain cost must require that at least 15% of the labor hours are performed by apprentices with limited exceptions. DES is required to provide information and technical assistance for apprentice utilization to affected agencies and collect certain data on covered projects from those agencies. DES also oversees the purchase of motor vehicles for the state and the state motor pool with certain exceptions. All state vehicles that are required to be marked are required to be marked on the lower left-hand corner of the rear window with the name and insignia of the operating agency or institute or with the word state motor pool. And finally, the department was directed to prepare information encouraging individual financial planning for retirement and provide potential consequences of early retirement for plan one members of PERS and TERS um, systems who s meet certain criteria to retire early in 1992. The Department of Retirement Systems distributed that information to those potential early retirees and persons who elected to retire early were to sign a statement acknowledging their receipt of that information. Under Senate Bill 6228, if a public entity determines that the public works project will be executed by an alternative contracting method and the contract amount is above the $25,000, the entity must pu publish notice of the work on the state or municipality's website in addition to in the, in the newspaper. DES is no longer required to provide financial planning for early retirement of Plan 1 members of PERS and TERS systems and will only provide information to, and technical assistance for apprentice utilization to agencies they serve, collecting certain data on covered projects on behalf of those agencies. And finally, statutory references to the state motor pool are removed. DES maintains oversight of the state agency fleets and vehicles must continue to be marked with the words designating the vehicle is owned and managed by DES. If fiscal note is available and shows no fiscal impact, there is a House Companion, House Bill 2625, sponsored by Representative Hudgens, which is scheduled for a hearing on the 30th and exec on the 31st. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions? Early retirement in 1992, huh? It was, it was a temporary program. <laughs> I think the time has passed. Yeah. Prime sponsor, Senator Cooter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as has been pointed out, this is agency request legislation, and uh, Melissa did a fabulous job of giving the overview in the interest of saving time for all the witnesses who want to testify. I'm going to save, I'm not going to say anything and let Gabrielle handle it for me. Okay. Gabrielle Stillwater. And Mr. Chair, no one else has signed in to testify. Good morning, Chair Hunt and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Gabrielle Stillwater and I'm the Government Relations Specialist with the Department of Enterprise Services. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of our agency request legislation, Senate Bill 6228. In Section 1, this bill will increase transparency by requiring certain public works projects to be posted on the state's or municipalities website, in addition to being posted in a newspaper. While I am uncertain about the municipalities having their own websites, DES manages the Washington Electronic Business Solution website site or webs and projects are available to everyone through the public bid calendar on the webs for vendors section. Additionally, this change will save money that can be routed back into the public works projects. Section two relates to our public works statutes that requires 15% of all labor hours to be performed by apprentices for contracts over $1 million. The purpose of this requirement is to help people get into the trades and build a sustainable, skilled workforce. The updated language clarifies that enterprise services will only provide information and technical assistances to the agencies that we serve and also collect data on behalf of those agencies for labor performed by apprentices. School districts and the Department of Transportation are not agencies that DES serves as they have their own public works contracting authority. 
Section three and four addresses language that was not modernized when DES was created in 2011. We seek to remove the outdated term state motor pool and replace it with the Department of Enterprise Services. There will be no additional cost to this change as the identifying markers will be updated as new vehicles are put into the fleet. And finally, the last section of the bills repeals an outdated RCW that indicates DES staff provide financial planning for retirement. And speaking with the Department of Retirement Services, they confirm that they provide this service already and were supportive of supportive of us for repealing this um, authority from our environment. The goals of this legislation are to increase transparency, clarifying language, align rebranding efforts, and repeal a du duplicative effort. Uh, thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. You can take a breath. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we don't you. have a motor pool anymore, do we? We, we don't. It's just a fleet DES services. fleet. Yep, fleet yes. services. So Updated new do semantics. Very true. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. Okay, anything else? Okay. And that will conclude the hearing on Senate Bill 6228. And we went a lot faster than I thought we would. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do, if we can get the prime sponsor down here, we will, we will break in when she gets here. You know, before we go to executive section, we can take a few minutes and start working on uh, a little technical amendment bill, uh, Senate Bill 6406. And this is Melissa Day, isn't it? Restoring fair treatment of unserved groups in public employment, education, and contracting. Melissa. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Before you is Senate Bill 6406. By way of background, the Laws Against Discrimination Chapter 4609 of the RCW generally prohibits discrimination in employment and public accommodation. The voters approved Initiative 200 in 1998, which was codified in the Laws Against Discrimination Chapter. I-200 prohibits the state, which is broadly defined, from discriminating against or granting preferential treatment to an individual or group based on race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin in public employment, public education, or public contracting. There are some actions or classifications that the initiative does not prohibit, for example, actions required to establish or maintain federal program eligibility if ineligibility would result in a loss of federal funds or providing separate athletic teams based on sex. If a conflict between I-200 and federal law, the U.S. Constitution or the Washington State Constitution exists, I-200 was to be implemented to the maximum extent of those laws. I-200 was amended once in 2013 in relation to admission of employment of schools established under state tribal compacts. Under this bill, Initiative 200 is repealed in its entirety, including the 2013 amendment, and conforming changes are made to the statute specifically related to the University of Washington Alternative Contract contracting, job order contracting, and apprenticeship programs. A fiscal note was not requested, and with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions? Okay, well, where do we go here? Our prime sponsor is probably running down the stairs as fast as she can, but uh, let's start with some witnesses. Let's get this I think we'll try to go till, well, we'll just see how we do. We get as far as we can until we break for executive action, then we'll come back and finish up. Teresa Bernstein, Roger Millar, and Kevin Allen. There she is. Oh, perfect timing. I said she was running down the stairs. <laughs> I was. Welcome, Senator Chase. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate your hearing this bill support and a very important public policy issue for us to consider. We've had this bill for somewhat, what, 20 years? We've had uh, Initiative uh, 200, and it's time that we take a look at it and uh, see, has it done what people thought it would do? And I believe it has not. And I have a lot of evidence to show you, which I won't take up the time because I'm sure my colleagues in the back here are prepared to enlighten you with what's been happening. 
But for me, it is a question of justice and fairness. And we do a lot of work down here. Uh, but it makes little sense to me that while we work on discrete projects, that we are ruining the financial health of many of our working families, middle class people, people who do not have an opportunity to participate in this great country you know, for any number of reasons. Oftentimes, it is our public policy that causes these problems. And by our public policy. Can you, excuse me, can you pull that microphone a little closer? Thank you. Sure. It is by our public, oh good. Hey. It is by our public policy that we cause a great deal of this pain in our communities. Whether it's increasing property taxes to the point where people living on limited income cannot afford to pay the property taxes. We drive them out of their homes. Whether it is homelessness because we have made living in a home too expensive for people. You know? I'm, uh, whether it is, for example, one of the things that I am very concerned with right now, and I have a bill that I'm trying to move through this legislature on the GED, you know, people who want to get a better job or who want to have a, uh, a go to college, who want to return adults who need to get a GED in order to get access to a credential that will certify their competency to participate in our economy. And we're denying them the ability to be able to do that by our public policy. Initiative 200 was put in by the people. You know, we thought we were doing the right thing. It turns out we didn't do the right thing. We did the wrong thing. And I am very grateful to you for opening up this issue so we can take a look at it. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Senator Melosha. Uh, thank you, Senator, for bringing this and starting this discussion. So just tell me in your own words, you know, I-200 simply prohibits the state from discriminating against a group based on race, sex, color, and natural origin. And that's been all the issues we've been discussing for the last two years. So why is that wrong? Why do we should we now discriminate based on sex, national origin, race, et cetera? So why, why is repealing that concept uh, a good thing? I think it goes down. I've been thinking a lot about that very issue. I appreciate you bringing that up. I think that when we legislate here, we hopefully have a set of principles by which we guide our actions, justice and fairness. And when we find that the public policies that we enact are not fair and are not just, we look at the outcome. What happened was you might have a, a public policy that you think is a good deal. You know, this is fair, it's just, everybody wins. And then you take a look at the empirical evidence and you see that that is not the case, then you need to, you need to revisit you know, your issues. Because if we have a principle in this state that people are equal, you know, we stand up in the, in, the, in the Senate and pledge allegiance to the flag with justice and fairness for all. Justice for all means fairness. And if our policies are not fair, you know, we need to come back. If one group is, 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 has been decided whether overtly or accidentally, to pay the burden of, of a bad policy while others are not, then we need to look at it. And I'm not saying that some groups should pay the price. I'm not saying that because we, 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 we get justice and fairness. For example, for African Americans that, say, white women or another ethnic group should pay the price. We have a responsibility for balance and fairness. And I think that's why we need to look at this policy because the outcome of the policy has been totally unfair. And I guess I would ask, you know, we talk about uh, prohibiting discrimination, but we also, one of the keys of this, I think are two phrases, preferential treatment and priority in admissions. 
You agree with that? I absolutely, I agree. Absolutely. No. You've been Mr. Doing Chair, if you don't mind, I'd like to sort of throw we have in an interloper this, among us. <laughs> <laughs> Senator sort of, Hasegawa. Yeah, welcome. I'm. I'm not a very good lurker, I guess. <laughs> Um, to, and to, to, he's also second on the bill, I might add. Uh, do you mind if I, I had a, something to say, but I would like to address your questions too because they are very important questions. And Senator Malosh, I think you're hitting at the heart of what the opposition is trying to convey, that this is like somehow reverse discrimination. But the issue about discrimination is people who are in a minority have no ability to discriminate against people who are in a majority. It's a... It, Discrimination is a result of a power imbalance. And so in nature, if you have more force pushing one way than the other, the object naturally goes the other direction, right? It's, it's a question of balance of power. So if we're gonna have real equity in our society, we have to bring equity to, the, to, the, to counterbalance that overwhelming power in some kind of way. So to say that people who are in a minority can actually discriminate against the minority. Maybe on an individual case-by-case -case thing, but we're talking about macro concepts here. We're talking about society. And there have been a thousand-fold more cases of discrimination to build the power of the majority over the minority over time. So this is about bringing balance, as Senator Chase said, back into our um, society. But what I wanted to do was show just a little cartoon to give a concept of what that was. There was a handout that I handed up to you. So this is a pretty good, it, it looks like this. Um, you, you may have seen this and, and I'm sure oh, it's, it's showing on the board right now, but this is essentially all we're talking about. People say we have equality in society, but how equal does the child on the right in, either, in, in the left picture feel? And if the box represents equality, yeah, they all got one box to stand on, big deal. Where is the real equity in this comparison picture though? The child on the right comes from a tougher starting position. If we're gonna allow that child to actually enjoy life and participate in what's going on out there in the real world, uh, that child, because it's coming, he's come, he or she's coming from a, a further starting place from behind, needs more support to get, to get that equity. So that's all we're talking about. So in, when I-200 was passed back in 1998, December 1998, uh, for instance, there were 50% of the Native Americans were on track to go to college. Just six years later, that had dropped after the implementation of I-200 down to 38%. And we see that type of inequity throughout. I handed, out, handed you out another matrix that looks like this one. So if you go to the right column of the darkened portion, and the, it's by year, so the total spend of government contracting dollars, for instance, back when I-200 was being considered, total government spend to minority contractors was 13.3%. A mere six years later in 2004, from 13.3% down to 1.66%. So what happens when we deny minority contractors arbitrarily, I mean, we could have fixed this. We could make sure that it's, we're trying to be equitable and even 13.3% was not equitable, but it was sure a, a, a lot better than 1.6%. So when we see the implementation of I-200 taking away that second box that the child on the right needs to have equity in our society, then we're just further oppressing that. And so we see disparities popping up everywhere, you know, in the criminal justice system, in the higher education system, in housing. If you look in Seattle right now, uh, you know, historically diverse communities like in the Central District or South Seattle, people are just being forced right out of it because there's no equity in our um, 
revenue practices, our taxing policies, our, our social policies that support people to be able to afford to live in these in our own communities. So what, what we're talking about is um, just because disparities have grown so much with the advent of I-200 and the removal of that second box of support for the child, um, I think it's time for us to reconsider this social experiment that has been a drastic failure and give people of color and minorities a um, a real opportunity at equity once again. So I, I thank you, Chair Hunt and members of the committee for considering this a very important bill uh, to bring equity back to our society. Let's let's thank you, but no, let's not go to get into applause here. Uh, Senator Melosha has a question. Yes, sir. Uh, Thank you for coming in front of the committee. Uh, help me understand, you know, a lot of the recent criticism against the president is that he is supports discrimination against um, uh, country of origin, uh, race, sex, and I-200 prohibits that. So this seems like this would go against the kind of criticism of the president if we allow this to happen. But more specifically, at least in other states, uh, how this affects the Asian American community. Um, they are frankly overrepresented in higher ed, you know, because it's merit based. It's not based on other factors. But if you allow discrimination, you find out that starts pushing down um, uh, attendance for that community. Uh, is that fair that one group is, 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 uh, given advantages over others, and you start picking the winners and losers from the different communities of color. I think advantages is a relative term, and I think that's the wrong frame to look at it. Um, you know, to talk about the state of the body politic in the United States when you've got uh, President Trump out there, um, I've become a firm believer in Missouri's slogan, show me, and what do the numbers say, and where are we going from there? So we just see further exacerbation of income inequality and uh, housing inequality, criminal justice inequality. Uh, in fact, to deal with the, some of those issues, for, for instance, right now we've got a bill, 5588, which is sitting on the floor calendar to do racial impact statements on felony convictions so that we can actually know before we start passing bills whether or not they're going to have uh, disparately negative impacts on different communities of color. We need to know these things, but the data is showing that we're going the wrong way. So regardless of the rhetoric, and, and when we talk about dis, uh, discrimination, I think that gets back to my first answer to your question, which is that discrimination is the result of a power imbalance. So if you don't have power, it's impossible for you to discriminate. You're being discriminated against. And, you know, the opposite of black and white, well, you can say um, if you're not black, you're white. But there's so many different shades in between that, and it, it's not a black and white issue. It's, it's, it's about bringing equity back to the system. I, but don't you find like this discriminates against the Asian American community? That's what the data shows. Well, the data is, and certainly there are segments of the Asian community that is doing very well. Um, but I think you need to disaggregate that data because if you look at, and what it boils down to is economics. I mean, to, to have an, a shot in our capitalist system, you have to have an economic foundation on which to build your future. Um, so when we're talking about uh, the Asian demographic as a whole, I think that's doing an injustice to many of the newer immigrants. You take the Pacific Islanders communities, not to disrespect them at all, but they're coming from a much further back starting place than those of us who have been here for several generations now. So, um, and you know, we, we're gonna be doing a Day of Remembrance recognition here on February 19th. And um, that, 
historically has is one of the high or maybe low lights of the discrimination that exists. It's taken generations for our community to recover from that, but the African American community still has not recovered from the historic slavery and the discrimination that they've had in the past. Uh, most minority communities, I think that uh, in our era of high technology, um, some have, some within the Asian demographic have found a niche there. I will grant you that. But most of the Asian demographic is still struggling. Is that the tickle finger of fate or what? Mm-hmm. You want to make like a quick say, comment? I, I do. I do want to make another a comment. I want to submit for the record. Uh, I have letters from the president of the University of Washington, the president of Washington State University, and from uh, Council, King County Council, and also a letter from uh, the King County Labor Council, the Martin Luther King County Labor Council, uh, in support of our efforts to take another look at this and to move this bill forward. So I'd like to submit those for the record. Thank you. We'll do that. Senator Saldana. Is that my understanding was that there were there is broader and broader support now that this has been 20 years. So Mm -hmm. this was when I was a freshman in college um, when I 200 was on the ballot um, and I I had major fears of what I 200 would mean for the future of not just myself, but my colleagues. And I think to your point, the data shows and I think even Seattle Times recently has made a, a case as for consideration to re- repeal I-200, is that correct? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, I guess that's a yes. <laughs> Senator Kuder. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Hasegawa, your cartoon reminds me of something that my dad used to say to the nine of us when we would complain that uh, he was treating the other one more favorably. And he would say, fair ain't always 50-50. <laughs> so I think uh, while I-200 was very well-intentioned, it misses the context. And this is what you and Senator Chase were providing for us today. And my question goes to the statistics. If we were to repeal this, do you, what do you project will happen in terms of how quickly we can recover from this hole we have seem to have dug ourselves into? It- Go ahead. I have thoughts about that. If I may. We would pass, um, in order to recover quickly, uh, there are a a huge number of public policy changes that we would have to see and that we would have to monitor. And we have been attempting to have an inclusive society for, for many, many, many years, and numerous people have worked on this issue. I don't think we can say it will ever be over, that we will successfully achieve a a just and fair society. Uh, But we can try, and and we have not been trying. It doesn't happen without some pretty strong uh, guidance and and, and an even hand. The invisible hand needs to to come out and and start getting and, and, and paying attention to the effect of our policies. You know, we talk about that we want a dynamic fiscal note, for example, to see what, what the impact is of, of our actions. We don't measure the impact of our actions in the, in the aggregate. We will see, you know, different empirical evidence studies that come out about different policies. But you can't, you can't just say, wave a hand and say, oh, it's, it's all fixed because we have destroyed the infrastructure that had been built up, for example, on the contracting. And it's a huge, it's a huge infrastructure to make an economic sector fair and just. We have to rebuild that. Um, so it'll take, it'll take a while. And that's actually where I was going to go, is that I don't see anything changing anytime soon. What it does do is remove the barrier from success, but success still requires a supportive infrastructure, social infrastructure. So, for instance, if you refer back to this chart again, with the amount of spend that has, the public spending has declined to minority contractors, that means the infrastructure or those contractors have 
you're going to fail. So if you notice the uh, second from the right column, the number of contract minority certified minority contractors in 1998 was 1,121. And then when it dro had dropped to 1.66, there was only 378 minority contractors. How do we rebuild that whole infrastructure so that the community can succeed? That's gonna take a lot of time and the similar requirements for rebuilding infrastructure in their education system and, and housing our, our, our entire economy. It's gonna take a long time, but what this does is removes that barrier uh, and, and give our communities an opportunity to succeed. And just by doing this, obviously, there will be other legislative changes that we have to be made down the line. This is not instant change, so to speak. So one example, if, if I could if just I a might. second, too. Um, I want to hear from John Carlson, who is calling in. He's not there? Okay. If he's not there, we will... Uh, okay. We're going to take a break for executive action after you two finish, and then we'll get John Carlson, who's the only person who's uh, signed in opposed to this bill, and let him give his uh, con statement. Can, can, oh, right now. Can I just do a quick follow-up? Yes. You were all um, in caucus, and maybe I don't know if I should share this, but when I, all of these bills that come to the floor that talk about modifying our contracting opportunities, the, the processes that cities and local governments meet, use, and remember I talked about that, but every time one of those bills comes up to try and streamline the contracting process, essentially people fought back in the 60s and 70s to make sure that we got away from that system. Now we're gradually going back towards that system. That's why I'm so attentive to when we see these changes, proposed changes coming to these um, municipal contracting processes that I try to include or at least make our caucus and the legislature aware that we are stepping backwards rather than forwards. Yes, it may look like streamlining, but when you're streamlining, the good old boy system is probably the most streamlined system there is. That's what we need to get away from and give everybody equity of opportunity. So I keep insisting on these amendments that sound like a pain in the rear, uh, but I just keep hammering on those because I think it's very important for us to understand the consequences of those actions. Keep on hammering. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, both of you. Thank you and, for hearing uh, this. As I said, we do have some bills for executive action. Hopefully we can get through those fairly quickly and uh, I think have, you know, hopefully 45 minutes or so to finish off this hearing so everybody can be heard. Thank so, you, Mr. Uh, Chair, I really appreciate it. As I that. mentioned, we have, uh, we have 19 people signed in to testify, 17 pro, one other, and one con, and we have 25 signed in not wishing to testify, all pro. So somebody's sending a message here. So. We are going to, I, I hate to do this, but we got our work to do too, and I hope you'll be patient with us. We will get back to this. Uh, we're going to uh, go to executive session. We are not going to uh, act on number five concerning dates and timelines with the operation of the state primary elections, which is probably the biggest lift there. Uh, can we have a quick summary of the, of the bills and amendments? Here we are. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. The first bill on your Excuse me. Can we have some, we need to hear, so if you're gonna have conversations, take them outside. If you wanna go out in the hallway and have a conversation, we'll, we'll, we'll get you back in here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, the first bill on the executive list is Senate Bill 5746, which concerns the Association of Washington Generals. This committee heard a proposed substitute um, on January 19th, um, which pertained to some changes in the Associ 
Asian Washington General's um, duties and also provided up to 25% of the Seattle Seahawks license plate towards uh, their efforts in educating students. Uh, there is an amendment on white color paper S4063.4, which changes the uh, proposed substitute that you heard on January 19th by uh, changing the allowance of what the Association of Washington Generals can use the funds for to now state that it is to create equity focused educational opportunities, including the Washington Worldwide Fellows Program. With that, I, there is a fiscal note now which shows an impact of uh, 20, about $20,000. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any additional questions you may have. Questions? Okay. The second bill before you is Senate Bill 5997, which you also heard on January 19th. This is the bill that um, is at the request of the state auditor and allows the auditor to establish rules for loss of funds, assets, or other legal activity and makes updates or removes certain audit functions and report requirements by the auditor. There is a striking amendment offered by Senator Melosha on blue color paper S4160.1, which would reinstate the requirement that the auditor conduct performance audit audits of long-term in-home care programs on a biennial basis. Everything else in the bill remains the same. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay. Keep rolling. The next bill on the list is Senate Bill 6079. That's a bill this committee heard last week that uh, exempts the dates of birth of public employees from public disclosure requirements. There are no known amendments at this time. Um, after that is Senate Bill 6161, a bill this committee heard Wednesday that requires the PDC develop a training course for campaign treasurers and deputy treasurers and um, that beginning next year, all campaign treasurers and deputy treasurers have uh, certified completion of that course before serving in that role. There are two amendments before you, both offered by Senator Hunt. Amendment S4340.1 is on cherry paper. That would exempt committees or candidates who expect to spend less than $5,000 in their campaign from the requirement that their treasurer or deputy treasurers complete the uh, training course. Amendment S4341.1 on gray paper, also offered by Senator Hunt, would exempt committees who, or candidates who expect to spend less than $10,000 in the campaign from the training requirements. Senator Melosha. Sorry, just missed that last point. One is 5,000, the other is 10,000? That's correct. Got it. Um, if there are no, no other questions, the next bill that was on our list, Senate Bill 6193, as Senator Hunt mentioned, is, has been pulled from the list. Uh, the, next, the next bill and joint resolution were considered together on Wednesday, Senate Bill 6246 and Senate Joint Resolution 8213. Those deal with lowering the threshold for approval of school district bonds from 60% to 55% and eliminating the requirement that a certain, that 40% of voters also participate in the election. Um, no known amendments on either the bill or joint resolution at this time. Um, if no, no questions on that, the next bill is Senate Bill 6373, which this committee also heard Wednesday. That deals with the hours certain agencies are required to be open for public records inspection. Um, that The bill, as introduced, would uh, let agencies which are open for, for fewer than 30 hours per week not con con continue their current practice. Um, it would also consider public records requests received uh, for the purposes of the statutory five-day response requirement at the uh, agency's next governing board meeting or 30 days, whichever is sooner. Um, there is one amendment to that bill that's being offered by Senator Melosha. That's Amendment S4339.1 on canary paper. That amendment would... Uh, instead of the provisions in the bill, um, direct a study into the feasibility of implementing a statewide electronic records portal for the agencies that are open less than 30 hours per week, um, including findings on technological and cost barriers to implementation for them putting their records online into that portal. Happy to answer any questions on that bill or the amendment. Seeing none, the next bill on our exec list is a proposed substitute Senate Bill 5108 that was sponsored by Senator Billig and heard two weeks ago. The committee heard a proposed substitute that requires that um, all independent expenditures list the five ultimate sources of largest funds rather than the top five. So um, going back rather than the, uh, the, the five largest sources that are actual persons or entities, not political committees. Happy to answer questions on that bill as well. Senator Melosha. 
Thank you. Wait, there, there's a striker, right? Am I reading that right? Uh, there's a proposed substitute that the committee heard. Oh, uh, it's the sub that the committee heard. The, the, yeah. the committee heard the sub. That's correct. The, the last bill on your list is Senate Bill 6006. This committee heard a proposed substitute, which I believe you have an orchid color paper on January 12th. The bill gives the governor authority to waive or suspend certain statutory obligations or limitations if the, of the executive functions if strict compliance would prohibit uh, the coping with an emergency. The governor is required to give as much notice as practical to the legislature and impacted local governments when issuing the orders and the waiver or suspension is limited to 30 days unless extended by the legislature through a concurrent resolution. There is um, a proposed amendment offered by Senator Hunt, S6, 3619.1 on ivory color paper, which removes one of the restrictions um, for the waiver exemption if it would conflict with the First Amendment rights and adds uh, the ability for leadership of the Senate and the House of Representatives to extend in writing the waiver or suspension of statutory obligations or limitations if the legislature is not in session. And it defines the leadership as the majority and minority leaders of the state, or the Senate and the House of Representatives. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Questions of Melissa? Okay. We are going to break for a brief caucus. The uh, Republicans can have the suite to our right, using that term loosely. And we will gather right up here, I guess. So we will be in recess for five minutes. We are in recess. Okay, the committee will come back to order. Uh, for those of you who may not have been here before, an executive session is not, like you think in the rest of government, a closed session. It is an open public session. It is when we move bills out of committee to either other committees or to the, to the rules committee. And uh, we vote on them, then they are out subject to signature. You'll see a bunch of uh, clipboards go through. And in order to actually get out, we have to have the signatures of a majority of the committee, just so you know what we're shuffling around up here. And, we're not playing playing games or making bets or anything. <laughs> so, okay, Madam Vice Chair. Mr. Chair, I move that proposed substitute number uh, S-4063.4 on white colored paper be adopted and receive a due pass recommendation to the Rules Committee. Thank you. On Senate Bill 5746, it has been moved that the proposed substitute be adopted and receive a due pass recommendation to the Rules Committee. Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. The bill is passed subject to signatures. And again, these are all bills that we've heard previously. So, Madam Vice Chair. Mr. Chair, this is on Senate Bill 5997. I move adoption of amendment number S-4160.1 on blue colored paper that the amendment be rolled into a proposed substitute and that it receive a due pass recommendation to the Rules Committee. Yes. Actually, we, okay. Yeah, actually, Senator Melosha should move that. But, well, well, no, well you, yeah, yeah, I will draw. I withdraw the amendment. Okay, so withdrawing the amendment. Mr. Chair, I move uh, that Senate Bill 5997 receive a due pass recommendation to the Rules Committee. Been moved and seconded that Senate Bill 5997, as we heard in committee, be reported to the Rules Committee. Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion carries subject to signatures, and Senate Bill 5997 is out to the Rules Committee subject to signatures. Senate Bill 6079. I move that uh, the bill receive a due pass recommendation to the Rules Committee. Been moved and seconded that Senate Bill 6079 be moved to the Rules Committee. Uh, discussion? Okay. Those in favor of moving Senate Bill 6079 out of committee with a due pass recommendation, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Motion is carried subject to signatures. Senate Bill 6079 is moved to uh, rule subject to signatures. 
Senate Bill 6161. I move adoption of a, amendment number S-4340.1 on cherry colored paper that the amendment be rolled into a proposed substitute and that it receive a due pass recommendation to the Ways and Means Committee. Thank you, and I am withdrawing amendment 4341.1. <clears throat> This amendment would uh, exempt from the training requirements for PDC people who are campaigns that file many reporting up to $5,000. The others would be included. Uh, further discussion? Those in favor, uh, let's see, th those in favor of, where we go? Okay. The motion has been made. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The bill is passed subject to signatures, and the bill is, uh, the substitute bill is moved out with a due pass recommendation. I think we messed that one up. No, we didn't. Didn't we? Okay, thank you. We are not going to do uh, Senate Bill 6193 at this time. That is on hold. We are going to keep uh, Senate Bill 6246 and SJR 8213 on hold for next week. And uh, we now go to Senate Bill 6373. We have a striking amendment proposed uh, by uh, Senator Molosian. And I'll withdraw that. I'll talk about that okay. later on. The amendment is withdrawn. Madam Vice Chair. I move that the bill receive a due, uh, bill, Senate Bill number 6373 receive a due pass recommendation to the Rules Committee. It's been moved and seconded that Senate Bill 6373 receive a due pass recommendation and be referred to the Rules Committee. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion no. carries. The bill is out subject to signatures. I did hear your no vote, sir. No. Okay. Uh, Senate bill, proposed substitute Senate bill 6006. Hmm? Did I miss one? Oh, 5108. Did we just do that one? No? No. Okay, excuse me. Senate Bill 5108. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Madam Vice Chair. Wait, wait, wait. No, I'm going to vote. No. Yeah, I will vote. I'm just going to vote. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You want to do your amendment, you striker? Or? No, it's your striker. Is it? On this bill? Yes. I think it is. Yes. Yes. You're going to vote for the striker. I'm going to vote. That's right. We have a proposed substitute in before us. And that's the one we heard in committee, heard it in hearing. Okay. Madam Vice Chair. I move that the proposed substitute be adopted and that the bill as introduced receive a due pass recommendation. It's been moved and seconded that the proposed substitute be adopted and that receive a due pass recommendation and move to the rules committee. Those in favor, wait, wait, wait. Sam. Is the motion to move the proposed substitute to rules or the original bill to rules? The, the proposed substitute number S-3258.1 on buff. Thank you. I appreciate the clarification. Yeah. It was my proposed substitute, right, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. So it's been moved and seconded that Senate Bill 51 that Proposed substitute Senate Bill 5108 be reported out to with a due pass recommendation sent to the Rules Committee. Uh, those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. No. Motion carries. Subject, the bill is out subject to signature. All right. <laughs> Senate Bill 6006. Statutory waiver for the state of emergency, Senator Zeiger's bill, Madam Vice Chair. I move the adoption of amendment number 3619.1 on ivory colored paper to the proposed substitute that the amendment be rolled into a new proposed substitute and that it receive a due pass recommendation to the Rules Committee. It has been moved that the uh, proposed, that the amendment 36191 on ivory be added to the proposed substitute and the amendment be rolled into a new proposed substitute and then to receive a due pass recommendation of the Rules Committee. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The bill is out subject to signatures. Whew. <laughs> Do we have Mr. Carlson? We need a motion here in just a second. We forgot a motion earlier.
We forgot to make a motion so we can go ahead here. Due to the short time the committee has to hear bills, I would entertain a motion to waive the five-day notice in considering Senate Bill 6406. <laughs> Madam Vice Chair. Mr. Chair, I move that the five-day notice be suspended for Senate Bill number 6406. It's been moved and seconded that the five-day rule be suspended. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We will now continue to consider Senate Bill 6406. Do we have Mr. Carlson? No? I, yes. Uh, Chairman Hunt, can you hear me? We can hear you, John. Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Excellent. Uh, I, first of all, Mr. Chairman, I would like to thank you. First of all, you have to introduce yourself for the record, John. Even a better idea, yes. I'm John Carlson. Uh, 20 years ago, I chaired the campaign to qualify and pass Initiative 200, the Washington State Civil Rights Act. I'm here to speak in opposition to Senate Bill 6406, speaking uh, just for myself, of course. And again, and John, just the one thing. We're going to yeah. try to keep to about two minutes, but since you're, you're the loyal opposition, I'll be a little lenient, but try to be, as always, brief and succinct. You know the radio deal. You can do it. Yes. I don't get three hours like my radio show? <laughs> In your of dream. Of course not. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for extending the opportunity. Uh, I appreciate it, Chairman Hunt. Uh, the liberal advocacy group Seattle Indivisible endorsed this bill, saying it would, and I'm quoting them here, restore an affirmative action component to the award of co public contracts. Imagine my surprise when I learned that 6406 is actually a full-on repeal of I-200 as it applies to college admissions and public employment and contracting. Some of you may not have been here when I-200 passed in 1998. Let's review that election. 98 was a good year for Democrats at the polls. That's the year that Jay Inslee made his way back to Congress, defeating a Republican incumbent. But I-200 which was outspent five to one and opposed by big business and big labor, most news media, almost all of academia, won with almost 59% of the vote. It won 38 of Washington's 39 counties, very nearly won King County. In fact, it won almost everywhere in King County outside the city of Seattle. According to a Seattle Times poll, it won a majority of men and women. 80% of Republicans supported it. So did 62% of independents, and interestingly, so did 41% of Democrats. Now think about that. Even though nearly every elected Democratic lawmaker that year opposed I-200, even though it was outspent 5 to 1, more than 4 in 10 Democrats still supported I-200. How come? Because voters believe that all of us, not as whites, not as blacks, not as men, not as women, but all of us as Americans should be protected from race or sex discrimination when applying for a college education or a government job or a public contract. That's the principle that drove I-200 to victory and will do again if need be. Regardless of what party controls government, it's wrong when that government uses different rules for different races. When it comes to state colleges and public employment, our racial differences, like our religious differences, should be minimized, not magnified. During the I-200 campaign, we were warned that its passage would mean an end to diversity on our college campuses. But look around. Everyone who's been on college campuses for 20 years knows that we have more diversity on our campuses today than we did 20 years ago. You don't need racial preferences and set-asides to have diversity in our society. Yes, you can emphasize race, and you can hire by quota, but doing so is divisive, it's toxic, and most important, it's unfair. You don't need to go back to those days. In fact, Mr. Chairman, I believe the more diverse our society becomes, the more imperative it is, the more essential it is that we treat people the same with a single standard of fairness. That is what I-200 stands for. 
I hope you will as well. And I thank you once again for the opportunity to testify this morning. Thank you, John, and thank you for, for taking time to, uh, to testify to us, too. I appreciate it. You bet. Okay, thank you. We will now... Uh, I do have to interrupt for just a second here because we have a couple legends in the room, but we have one real legend that I'd like to just welcome former Senator Rosa Franklin, who was a member of this body for years. Okay, now we have a couple groups that signed up as panels. We're going to start in with the panels and uh, we're going to do two minutes apiece. We've got 35 minutes. We've got 20, we got 18 people, so we should be pretty close. And we'll just try to get as many. We have sessions starting at 10, and the committee cannot go beyond 10. When the Senate goes into session, we have to be through. Of course, I just thought that this was going to transportation. Yeah, please do. Teresa Bernstein, Roger Millar, and Kevin Allen. And on deck will be Stephanie Bowman, April Putney, and Ed Senzavla. And those on deck, if you could just be waiting and ready to go, that would help a lot. Thank you. First up, let's go. All right. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Teresa Bernson. I'm the director of the Office of Minority and Women's Business Enterprises. We certify that businesses are small and that they're owned and controlled by a minority or a woman. Um, in addition to that, we're statutorily charged with reporting the amount of dollars that state agencies and higher education institutions spend in contract and procurement with certified small minority women-owned firms. So I will give you a couple data points. Um, in the five years before the passage of I-200, state agencies and higher education institutions spent 10% of their contracting and procurement dollars with certified minority and women-owned businesses. Since the passage of I-200, that rate has declined to an average of 3%. And additionally, the number of certified firms has declined by nearly half. If the rate of spending would have stayed at the levels prior to I-200, an additional 3.5 billion would have gone to small minority and women-owned businesses. I have to answer questions. Mr. Chair, uh, Ranking Member Militia, members of the committee, my name is Roger Millar. I'm the Secretary of Transportation for the State of Washington. Our agency does approximately $2 billion a year in contracting, uh, some of it in a federal program that is exempt from I-200 and most of it in a state program that is not exempt. Uh, I've been working on this issue since I came here in 2015, and one of the things that concerns us with I-200 is the, the difference between actions of state government and the outcomes of those actions. Are the actions discriminatory or providing a preference, or do the outcomes result in discrimination or preferential treatment? Um, I came here from Montana, and what I learned in Montana is you don't need facts to have a bar fight, but um, facts are helpful when you're having a discussion, particularly a discussion of uh, the issues that can get as emotional as these. Uh, we recently conducted what's called a disparity study, and the purpose of that disparity study is to look at the availability of firms and their utilization. And for the first time ever, we looked at both our federal spend and our state spend. When we looked at our federal spend, what we found was, while white males make up about 38% of the population of Washington State, they control 81% of the contracting. Um, the other 19% is divided between uh, white women-owned businesses, Native American businesses, Asian Pacific businesses, Hispanic businesses, and African American businesses. When you look at the availability of firms and how we utilize them, on our federal program, our our utilization rate is about 92%, where we have a, a mandatory DBE goal as a condition of award of a contract, about 92% of the available disadvantaged businesses are being engaged in the contracting. 
in our state program that has no mandatory goal, where we have aspirational goals, it's a voluntary program, our 92% availability or utilization drops to 33%. So what we're seeing is a 60 point spread in terms of the outcome of our actions. And we're seeing um, African Americans who make up a, 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 a you know, uh, about, uh, uh, well, they're getting 1.3% of the work. On our red lights. So I'm sorry, to wrap up. 1.3% of the work on our state programs. Uh, they're getting 22%, 1.3% uh, utilization, rather, on our state programs, 22% utilization on our federal programs. Both of those numbers are, are awful numbers, but we're seeing, again, that 60-point spread between where we can apply goals on our federal program and where we have not in the past applied goals on our state program. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the State State Senate Government Committee. My name is Kevin Allen, and I'm a member of the Executive Board of the Washington Federation of State Employees. I'm a 75 graduate of Yale University with a BA in Administrative Sciences, and I was a uh, uh, some of my uh, success can be attributed to affirmative action. As, as a state employee, I'm an adjudicator in the Division of Disability Determination Services in the Department of Social and Health Services. And I'm here representing the well over 40,000 state employees who serve over 2 million citizens in uh, Washington State. I've come to testify in favor of this bill, 6406, and our union has gone on record supporting the repeal of I-200 for many years for many reasons. Most of all, as a disability adjudicator, there's a term called resistance, of, resistance to gravity. You know, when a person is weak or paralyzed, whatever, uh, you can't raise up. And gravity is natural. And left to its own devices, we're going to have, and this has shown over history, we're going to have disparate treatment, bias, unequal pay, that's been baked into the system and baked into our society. We have to face that fact. Affirmative action was put together to kind of give that leg up, much like Senator Hoskow was showed with that box. Uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a quota, it's a goal. And it's clear that when you took, when I-200 came in and took away the option of affirmative action, gravity took its place. And that's why you see these dramatic numbers dropping in college admissions, in contracting, and employing. And that's why we need to pass this bill to bring back fairness and equity to Washington State, to increase diversity in education, employment, and contracting, and reverse the trend that's been taking place over the past uh, 20 years. I know it's an election year, so let's not resist. Let's resist the gravitational pull of politics and let's rise above that and bring back a tool that's an assistive device to make the playing field more level. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Call the next panel, please. Stephanie Bowman, April Putney, and Edson Zavla. And on deck, and please be ready to come up and testify, Karen Hikes, Herbie Martin, and Sandy Hanks. Great, good morning, uh, Chairman Hunt and members of the committee for the record. My name is Stephanie Bowman. I am a Port of Seattle Commissioner. On behalf of my colleagues at the Port of Seattle, I am here to offer our strong and repeated support for Senate Bill 6406 for the repeal of Initiative 200. For the last 20 years, our hands at the Port of Seattle have been tied. Because of the restrictions of I-200, we have empirical evidence that disparity has grown, meaning opportunity has been denied to those who have not had the traditional advantages of contracting. I would ask you a question. How many Caucasian males have come before this committee saying that they have not had enough work in the last 20 years? The port cares deeply about this issue for a number of reasons, but I'd like to highlight two. One, our role in providing critical infrastructure to the state of Washington through the investments in SeaTac International Airport and the marine terminals in the third busiest gateway in the United States states. 
In 2007, we spent $182 million, and over the next five years, we anticipate spending $3.2 billion in infrastructure investment. In short, we have a lot of work, and we need as many qualified contractors as possible on deck to help us with that. Number two, our role is an economic development catalyst for King County and the state through RCW 5304. The Port of Seattle interprets that to mean opportunity for all, not just for some. The port is doing our part. I'll wrap up here quickly. Just last week, we passed a diversity and contracting initiative. We have set a goal for our staff to triple the number of firms, Wimby firms that we contract with over the next five years. We have set a goal to um, triple the number of dollars spent with Wimby firms over the next five years, and we have tied our executives' pay to reaching those goals. In short, the Port of Seattle is doing our part. We very respectfully ask you to do yours and repeal I-200. Thank you. We do this, we're, we, we applaud, we're just taking time away from people who want to testify. So, Got it. Good morning. Uh, my name is Edson Savala. I'm the Policy Advisor for Economic Inclusion and Contracting Equity in the Office of Mayor Jenny A. Durkin in the City of Seattle. Uh, in 2016, the State of Washington, through agencies and educational institutions, spent about $5.4 billion on goods, services, and contracts. The amount of money that was awarded to minority or, win or women businesses was $155 million, and this is less than the state was spending uh, on goods and services in 1998. This undermines the founding premise of I-200 to eliminate discrimination, and rather, what we have seen is enhanced and entrenched discrimination in Washington State. I-200 has impacted admission to universities and employment opportunities. I-200 promised to stop discrimination in college admissions based on race, but instead it has set up other roadblocks at the time when public colleges and universities want to foster more diverse student bodies. Employment opportunities are based on who you know, and when you're not allowed to enroll in, univers in universities, when you cannot build the relationships needed to advance forward. Uh, for a con and from a contracting perspective, it has had a very chilling effect on the economic development of, com of the companies throughout the state, and cities and public agencies rely uh, state that cities and agencies rely on to perform the work. We are losing the ability to have all our companies compete on an equitable level and losing companies from our bid pool because we are unable to reach out and support women and minority-owned businesses. Furthermore, the City of Seattle believes I-200 is in conflict with the national best practices and legal standards for government evidence-based contracting equity programs. It's the city's priority to be a more affordable, inclusive city, building economic opportunity for all of its residents. The city believes I-200 unnecessarily limits the tools available to implement reparative measures to address inequities and participation of women and minority-owned businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Karen Heikus, Herbie Martin, and Sandy Hanks, and on deck, Steve Claggett, Joey Gray, and Maria Flores. And please be ready to come up right after this panel is done. Good morning, Chair Hunt, members of the committee. My name is Karen Heikus. I am the Director of Policy and Partnerships for the Washington State Board of Education. And I am here to, on behalf of the State Board, to express our agency's support of Senate Bill 6406. State Board of Education has a variety of statutory responsibilities, um, one of which is to analyze the health of Washington's educational system on a biennial basis. The last time we did that was 2016, and our report showed achievement gaps by race in all achievement index school tier ratings. Gaps are present early, pre-kindergarten, kindergarten readiness, and persist all the way through to our post-secondary degree attainment data. This bill would provide institutions with more opportunities to address these gaps. This is the same visual that you saw earlier, um, but I, the right side for, for me is equity, not justice. Ju that's a whole nother conversation, justice. But I guess my question is, well, my point is there's people dif disagree on 
equity versus equality. And giving all the kids the same box does not give them the same thing. So the question is, are the additional boxes preferential treatment for these kids? Or is it simply giving them what they need in order to do what they need to do? Given our statutory charge um, and the opportunity gap data that we see regularly, the State Board of Education has spent the last year developing an equity lens to use for all of our work. And we butted up against I-200 in our development of our equity lens. And it became problematic for us. And you have a red light, so. And the same is true for many districts. The educational system must be equitable, not equal, if we want to address the achievement gaps and the opportunity gaps. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair. My name is Herbie Martin. I'm retired from the United States Army. I worked for the state of Washington for 16 years. <clears throat> I graduated from Seattle University with a master's degree in pastoral studies. I am the spiritual advisor of APRI. He's the one who organized the march in 1963. I conducted a special report. I will leave it with you all of the affairs of African Americans, but I'm, I'm speaking of all race of people of color. The, the data does not lie. I come because my children who lived here said, Dad, we can't get jobs. We don't want to live here. So I'm speaking for my personally and, and throughout the, the affairs I have for the state of, of Washington of this report of, of looking at housing, looking at the education system, looking at the medium income. The Seattle Times had an article that just was, was alarming to me. It says that Seattle gets richer, the city the city's black households get poorer, and that's what striked the nerve with me, and that's what made me want to sit down and collect this data. We make up 4% of the population. We make up almost 19% of the prisons. Um, home ownership, I believe if you see the exodus of Seattle, of people of color, because they can't afford the taxes. This article here says it was 23%. I'm pretty sure it's a lot lower than that now, it's 2018. This, this report was put together, I called it Moving the Needle, Critical Conversations About African American Affairs in Washington State, with, a, with, with a emphasis on access to education, vote rehab training, employment, equality with the court system, and housing. Um, I serve my country. I live in Shahomish. I believe I'm the only African American from Shahomish down here today. I, I got up this morning at three o'clock this morning. I was sitting out there in the parking lot until um, I could be here for this hearing. This is urgent. This is, the data does not lie. It's the truth. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good morning. My name is Sandy Hanks, and I'm here on behalf of Martin Luther King Jr. County. Thank you for consider your consideration of Senate Bill 6406. This is an extremely important policy for the state of Washington, and King County fully supports it. But we, like the rest of our region and state, have challenges in getting to this vision. The stark reality is this. In King County and Washington State, race is still a major predictor of whether somebody will graduate from high school, get a good paying job, become a business owner, and live a long, healthy life. For example, the median income for white families is about double the median income for African American families in King County. As an employer, in some racial categories, our employee population roughly represents our overall King County population, though this is not true for all groups, such as Latinos and Asian Americans, both of which are underrepresented. King County has a growing and increasingly racially diverse population, and it is paramount for us as an organization to change with our population Unfortunately, existing state law has continued to enforce historical 
and structural limitations that have stunted King County's efforts to hire and promote the best and most qualified employees from our communities for public service careers. We support Senate Bill 6406 because it would eliminate this barrier for our advancement. King County also contracts for a multitude of services. Last year, the county's total procurement spend was 2.2 billion. Senate Bill 6406 would, per, would permit King County to develop improved contracting and procurement programs to ensure the equitable investment of financial resources in our community and in ways that reflect the diversity of our community. We urge you to pass Senate Bill 6406. Thank you. Steve. We have 15 minutes left and we have about 16, 17 people who want to testify. So the more rapid fire you can be, the better off. All right. Good morning, Chair Hunt and members of the committee. I am Maria Flores. I am the Director of Title II Part A and Special Programs at the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. I am testifying pro on behalf of the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. In public education, we have a persistent and unacceptable opportunity and achievement gap in which our students of color and our students living in poverty, as well as our students receiving special ed and English learner services, have not been equitably served by our education system. In order to better serve all of our students, our public schools must cre create equity in our system. We know that students benefit from seeing teachers who look like them and share their experiences. We work with school districts to help them create an educator workforce which reflects and matches the demographics of our students. Our students are incredibly diverse and in many school districts, our students of color are not the minority, they are the majority. However, our educator workforce is predominantly composed of women and is predominantly white. Our school districts have been working to recruit and retain a diverse and qualified workforce and this bill may assist in that goal. Additionally, under the Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA, OSPI is required to identify large opportunity gaps in schools for targeted assistance for school improvement. School districts are required to serve and address student achievement and outcome data from a needs assessment to target resources to student subgroups who have large opportunity gaps. In order to do so, school districts and OSPI must, <clears throat> um, must provide additional services and resources. This bill will clarify to, that school districts that have been told under council about I-200 that they could not create additional services for those students that they indeed can and will in turn help us close those opportunity gaps and create an education system that equitably serves all of our students. Um, also, uh, just to a quick follow-up on Senator Melosha's question, um, the issue with I-200 is the interpretation of preferential treatment. We are still prohibited by federal law to look uh, to discri not discriminate. And in discrimination law, we look at both disproportionality and disparate impact. So for disproportionality in public education, that looks like African American, Pacific Islander, Hispanic, and Native American students being suspended or expelled at disproportionately higher rates than their peers. Um, that's what we would hey, look at. Course, it also, but your time is up. Yes. If you've got that in writing, you can share it with sure. us. Sure, and just, uh, again, we look at disparate impact and we monitor federal civil rights okay. law at OSPI. Okay. Thank you. you want to do the on-deck panel and then we'll go next here? Sure, that would be uh, Eddie Rye Jr., Leslie Cushman, and Hayward Evans. Please get ready to come up and testify. Hello. First, uh, as is customary, I'd like to acknowledge the Squaxin people and the Nisqually people. My name is Joey Gray, and I'm an independent contractor, IT consulting. And I, I grew up in Thurston County and went to high school here. In 1982, I took my first computer science class, computer programming. In that class, there were about 20 plus students eight computers that were dominated by a small group of guys who who played games on those computers the whole time. One of those guys, my friend, my neighbor, became a close colleague of Bill Gates and is, you know, fabulously wealthy and and contributed to writing the programs that are on uh, the computers here and that, that we've all used all our, our, our adult lives. Um, that the rest of us sat at our desks and didn't know what to do in that class. That's where bias starts. Those, that small group of homogenous men have built the systems that our state is running on. 
And to the question that you asked earlier, um, why is repealing that concept, the concept of, of, of um, allowing the full representation of our state to participate in the education and the employment and the design of the systems um, is, is not a good thing. That's a, it's a flawed, it's an illusion that, that fairness is built into a system that doesn't recognize race, gender, and background. And it's really important to create openings for all the voices to be involved in the design of systems. And I would urge you to start today on giving back a voice to all Washingtonians in building those systems. Thank you. Good morning, honorable senators. My name is Steve Claggett, and I'm a member of the Faith Action Network, known as FAN. FAN is supporting, and I also urge, passage of Senate Bill 6406 to repeal Initiative 200. I can best testify to you today. Steve, from, Steve, we, have your we have your testimony in writing, so if you could just summarize it so we can move along. Uh, I, would ra I would not have given you my testimony in writing if I can't speak it to, so everyone can hear. I'm going to go ahead, sir. I uh, have a minute and a half left. I can best testify to you today from my heart. I am a white person, 70 years old, who has enjoyed a lifetime of priv privilege denied to persons of color. I could provide you with a litany of privileged benefits I've enjoyed, including having the chair of Dartmouth College's Board of Trustees urge I be taken off the wait list, my father having the Michigan Speaker of, House of the House urge that I be given a job at a state agency, avoiding Vietnam due to flat feet, never having to have, have, to have the talk with my children about a public safety officer stop, and much more. As a state, we were mistaken to believe that after hundreds of years of oppressing indigenous people, bringing blacks here as slaves, exploiting migrant Asian labor to build our railroads, interning Japanese citizens after Pearl Harbor, redlining neighborhoods by race, and so much more, we are now going to, quote, play flair, unquote, institute for full equality, and ignore race in university admissions and state hiring and contracting. Initiative 200 was not an honest moral move to equality. It did not properly account for history, history of white privilege and domination. It did not own up to our past. Rather, it hid behind an ideal of freedom and equality for all that is a smokescreen obscuring reality. And worst of all, Initiative 200 allows us to hide from and perpetuate the damage our dominant white society has inflicted on peoples of color. Affirmative action is a just and necessary tool to bend, as Dr. King said, the moral arc of the universe towards justice. Passing Senate Bill 646 will let us continue to build a fully diverse and participatory society that works to right past wrongs. You as legislators can lead us from our past mistakes. Please have courage and do this. Thank you. Eddie Rye Jr., Leslie Cushman, and Hayward Evans. And on deck is Jesse Weinberry, Abdul Yusuf, and John Yasutaki. And Mr. Chair, that will be our last panel. And there are 27 others signed in not wishing to testify all pro. Let me just interrupt a second. Senator Franklin, did you want to, when we're, you're just going to sit here and cheer. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, my name is Eddie Rye, and I'm here to support the passage of uh, Senate Bill 6406. Uh, the reason why so many people voted for this, responding to John Carlson, is because people thought they were voting for civil rights. Uh, after this bill is passed, uh, they said this was going to be against preferential treatment. How can you explain white males get 97% of the state contracts as there's no, no preferential treatment? Now, when Ward Connolly came to Seattle, uh, he was able to pull this off. When he went to Florida, Governor Jeb Bush sent for Dr. Arthur Fletcher, the father of Herman Action, and he shadowed uh, uh, Ward Connolly everywhere he went, and it didn't pass in Florida. Now, we've been controlled by Democrats for a long period of time. And yet, uh, even where there's a federal program with the Washington State Department of Transportation, we still see where majority male white contractors will not select African Americans. Now, what we have to look at is what the, the, the effect has been of this legislation, of passing it. Uh, everybody thought it was a good idea. A lot of people didn't know. But now we see that blacks are doing less than one-tenth of one percent with the state of Washington. We have lost the central area because of economic apartheid. Uh, once a, a contract select through the Department of Transportation, it's up to the contractor to select minorities, and they select white women. 
White women do over 80% of the federal money coming through into the Department of Transportation. Is that preferential treatment? I would say so. The other thing, uh, seeing the, the atrocities that uh, Initiative 200 brought in the legislation, uh, State Representative Sharon Tomiko Santos had House Bill 1328 passed last year, which would allow smaller contractors to compete against each other. Sound Transit adopted that uh, language in their contracting policies on December 21st of uh, 2017. Now, the state can do some things, too, if they have the will to do it. Unfortunately, the will has not been there. And as long as you rely on white males to select blacks, it will never happen. And I also want to say, in 1975, we had more students who were descendants of United States slaves attending the University of Washington that we have right now. The University of Washington spent $225 million on a football stadium and a black didn't get one dime, but yet who's running up and down the field? And those are probably the only African Americans on the campus that's doing anything. Are the football players who are creating revenue for the University of Washington that won't fairly treat black applicants fairly for admissions. Yeah, and if I may on that note, um, and I'm going to speak on that note just for a second. My daughter just graduated from the University of Washington. Oh, excuse me. My name is Hayward Evans. I'm from the 537th. There's my center. And uh, thank you for having us here today. I'm here to support uh, Senate Bill 6406, as you know. But on that note that Eddie just uh, presented to you, my daughter is at the University of Washington. When she moved into uh, student housing and went down to the, um, went down to the cafeteria, the eating, the eating room, they asked her, uh, what sport do you play? I mean, come on now. But she did graduate, she's going to the nursing program there. So, but anyway, on another note, uh, we understand that taxpayers of all races contribute public funds. The law requires that funds be allocated and spent in a fashion that does not encourage, entrench, and subsidize any entity that results in racial discrimination. Clearly from the evidence that's been presented by Senator Chase, by Senator Hasegawa, that uh, racial discrimination has taken place. The passage of, uh, there's been three federally approved disparity studies that I'm familiar with, and I haven't completed reading the states yet, but we have the federal, uh, the washed-out study, and thank you, Roger. Millard's done an excellent job really trying to bring in more firms of color. But the disparity study completed by WASHDOT, the disparity study by Sound Transit, and the disparity study by the uh, Port of Seattle, and I'm gonna thank Commissioner Bowman for what she said. All of them prove that racial discrimination does exist under I-200. And as was shared with you earlier, billions of dollars have been lost. If you go back to the passage of uh, 1964 Civil Rights Act, Title VI, it was there in place because of discrimination. Now we remove that barrier here, and as you saw the numbers, for a, a long period of time, we were improving our position. But as soon as I-200 passed, November 1998, uh, instituted December 1998, the numbers have dropped uh, to the point that capacity in certain communities, particularly the African American communities for businesses, is almost non existent. So we need your support, and we're encouraging you on behalf of the African American Civil Rights Commission and the uh, um, the uh, King County uh, uh, Coalition for Contracts and Jobs. We want you to pass this bill, please. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Leslie Cushman. I'm a member of the Pacific Northwest Conference of the United Church of Christ Ministry on Dismantling Racism. There's 110 churches in our conference. I live here in the 22nd District. Senator Hunt is my senator. SB 6406 is about fairness. It recognizes the incredible staying power of institutionalized racism. The system has numerous points of bias and advantage that work to maintain racism. It, there is strong evidence and proof that race is a social determinant of health and wealth. We must address this in our systems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our last panel, Jesse Weinberry, Abdul uh, Yusuf, and John Yasutaki. Good morning, Senators. Uh, my name is Abdul Yusuf. Uh, I'm from the 37th District. Can you pull that microphone a little closer, please, Yasuf? Do it again. Yeah. Can I get it restarted, my time? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> my name is Abdul Yusuf. Good morning, Senators. Um, it's actually amazing. I've been listening to the debate going on. Um, I saw the President of the United States call African countries a shithole, countries that have been colonized uh, by the same people who enslaved the African-Americans in here, I mean, racial-wise, 
and then install governments that work for them mentally. So even though Africa is free, <clears throat> it's still being colonized mentally. And in here, people have been enslaved for 400 years. And I was surprised for Senator Minusha to say that, why can we not be equal now? I mean, having 400 years or so of inequality and unjust and slavery and few years of uh, affirmative action is not even good enough. But for that to be taken out by the public with the data that you have and the argument is still being that way, I think I don't understand something's wrong. What I would ask is to pass this bill and not only pass it, but actually to undo the damage this has done for the last 20 years by actually doubling or tripling or quadrupling the effort that it needs to catch up. What is going on is not whether it's a just or not. It is simply to make people come to a position where they can compete. If I cannot compete, how the hell are you gonna ask me to be fair and equal? So I think it's the right thing to do but it's a lot more work just simply by passing. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Mr. Mr. Chair and distinguished members of the committee, my name is John Yasutaki. I'm uh, representing the Washington State Civil Rights Coalition, but also I have a kind of unique position. I was the one who crafted the Washington State's affirmative action effort way back under two governors, uh, the late Governor Spellman and the late Governor Dixie Lee Ray. I was on assignment from the Washington State Human Rights Commission, and I wrote and revised most of what was the affirmative action effort, as well as administered it at that time, which meant I needed to, <clears throat> excuse me, approve all relevant affirmative action programs submitted by K-12 school districts, colleges, universities under HEPB, as well as agencies under the governor's cabinet. So uh, basically I had the whole shebang. And uh, what I wanna say is this, if you believe that there has been discrimination and that discrimination exists, one of the best tools that we have is affirmative action because affirmative action was crafted and created to deal with the present effects of past discrimination. The only way you can dismantle it is to do it from a conscious programmatic effort. It is not quotas. Quotas are rigid. Goals are flexible. No one hired under affirmative action under my it's my belief where it was ever hired that they weren't qualified for those positions. Again, the bottom line is you select from individuals who meet the minimum qualifications for the position and you hire according to what your need is in terms of what is under representation and what is under utilization. So it is a conscious, it is a basically, it makes a lot of sense is, is what I'm saying. And uh, you can't have effective civil rights unless you have the tools and affirmative action is one of them. And so I would encourage you, please support and pass Senate Bill 6406. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I am coming here to speak for less than the, the allotted time. My name is Jesse Weinberry, former state representative for the 43rd as well as the 37th from 85 to 95. Uh, I obviously since I left in 95 I left before 1998 the infamous year that I 200 was passed I come here to say thank you on behalf of everyone seated behind me and the uh, literally millions of people of color and women and immigrants and others who are who have been victimized by I 200 for the last 20 years thank you for allowing this bill to be heard a, a bill to repeal I-200 for the first time in 20 years. We ask that you uh, cast a vote in the spirit of justice, in the spirit of fairness, and in the spirit of equity. Um, if you want some cover, recognize that the United States Supreme Court has been given repeated opportunities, and I am an attorney actually inducted into to practice before the U.S. Supreme Court, that court has been given repeated opportunities to strike down race as a factor, whether it be in hiring, contracting, or admissions. And repeatedly, the United States Supreme Court has said that, it, that what must be applied is a strict scrutiny test. And if that test shows, whether it be by a state or a university or a, a department, if that test shows that there is a compelling state interest 
to continue using race, that they are permitted to do so. That's what right now I-200 violates. And so we want to, we, we're here to keep Washington State in compliance with federal law, in compliance with the United States Supreme Court, and we hope you will vote SB 6406 to the next level. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I would like to thank all of you for what I consider extremely compelling testimony today. Uh, I would quote Oprah, but I don't remember the exact words she used. <laughs> but I want to thank you, and uh, certainly it's time that we take a look at this, and uh, hopefully we will continue to move this bill along. Again, thank you all, and uh, with that, the hearing is adjourned.